If you're looking to be your very best self to find transformation, hope, and healing, maybe you face something with a relationship or with your environment or with a toxic issue or with an autoimmune disease or with long COVID, join us today for some deep dive answers on all levels on how to create resilience in your life and find health and healing and happiness. All right. Welcome everyone to a new episode of the NeuroFlex podcast. I am your host, Toby Passman. On the show with us today, we have a very special guest, Dr. Jill Carnahan. Dr. Jill is your functional medicine expert and author of Unexpected. She's the leading voice in mold and mold-related illness and often referred to as the Sherlock Holmes of medicine. In fact, she was recently featured in People Magazine for solving the medical mystery behind ABC's The Bachelorette's Ryan Sutter's years-long battle with Lyme disease. Dr. Jill is double board certified in family medicine and integrative holistic medicine and has sustained a five-plus year waiting list as the medical director of Flatiron Functional Medicine, a widely sought-after practice. She uses nutritional protocols and, med and supplements lifestyle changes and medication to increase patient level of function and always seeks the gentlest and least invasive way to restore health and optimize healing. As a survivor of breast cancer, Crohn's disease, and toxic mold illness, Dr. Jill brings a unique perspective to treating a variety of complex and chronic illness and has traveled the world sharing her knowledge of hope, health, and healing live on stage as well as through newsletters, articles, podcasts, books, and social media. So Dr. Jill, really excited to do uh, to have you on the show with us today. Thank you, Toby. Great to be here. And thanks for having me. Of course. So I'm curious a little about kind of, you know, your origins of getting into functional medicine. Did you always know that you wanted to be a doctor? Did you at all kind of go the traditional like Western medicine path before getting into functional medicine? What what kind of led you down into the career path that you're in today? Yeah, so um, no, it was completely unexpected. <laughs> um, I grew up on a farm in Illinois with one of, I was one of five children. My mother, uh, mother was a nurse, my dad was a farmer. And um, we always, I guess the, the commonality was I didn't know as a healer, I was definitely born a healer, but a healer is born and not made. And so the heart of compassion and wanting to serve and like help people find meaning in their lives and actually deeper um, well, you know, health and happiness was always kind of a thing I wanted to do. I just didn't know the route. And I um, was modeled on the farm. I mean, we grew our own food, not everything, but we had, a, we had a garden and we have, you know, sweet corn and we had all kinds of organic produce. And then my mom being a nurse, always like, even though she was medically trained, she would always, if we got cuts or scrapes or sore throats, try herbal remedies or a tea or some chicken soup, where there was much more emphasis on trying to stay well and optimize the immune system and kind of doing things first before we went to the doctor. And we still went to the dentist and the doctor and all the regular things like normal kids did, but there was definitely an emphasis on living well and eating well and like getting nourishment from the earth and kind of that sustainability and kind of environmentally conscious before we even knew what that was because in the farm, you don't really, it's not the language. Um, so I kind of had that heart. I always say I had the heart of a naturopath. And then as I was applying, I went to undergrad, did bioengineering undergrad. I was very analytical minded, loved to solve problems. And what helped me in medicine was really um, pattern recognition and problem solving and how to optimize those kinds of um, skill sets in whatever I was doing. And I knew I wanted to go in a healing profession. So I just started applying. I applied to physical therapy school, chiropractic school, acupuncture school. And I was like, well, why not apply to medical school? And what's funny is my heart wasn't really aligned because I knew that there was more than just drugs and surgery, but I didn't know a ton. And I thought, oh gosh, I don't know if I can be the kind of healer I want to be. But what ended up happening is I got these acceptance letters to multiple avenues. And when I started getting accepted into allopathic medical schools, I thought, oh my goodness, could I really become a doctor? And it was literally those acceptance letters that, that allowed me to think past like, well, maybe. And then what happened, Toby, is so cool because I shifted and I thought, why not be trained in the best system for reimbursement in the United States at present, at least? I mean, still it's the predominant system, whether we like it or not. And um, and really learn this well so that if I'm doing foreign aid somewhere or doing a mission trip or working in my own backyard, that I have the skill set to really take care of and talk to the system and understand the system and that. And then I can kind of infiltrate and maybe even make some changes from the inside out. So I literally went in with that knowledge that this wasn't completely aligned with my philosophy 
on every level, but that I was wanting to learn this best system and really get knowledgeable so that I could take that platform and start to shift and change as I practice medicine, not knowing my career at all. And so I got into that and I actually was the first um, medical student to create a interest group for integrative medicine in that medical school. I was at Loyola in Chicago. So we brought in to the students, massage therapists and chiropractors and different practitioners to basically get exposure to what else was out there, these other healing modalities. So I kind of all the way through and I did a rotation. No other medical student did a rotation with a traditional Chinese practitioner, but I did. So I definitely did things a little differently. And then third year medical school, 25 years old, I get diagnosed with aggressive breast cancer. And that, as you can imagine, threw my life into a tailspin. Um, what many people don't know about breast cancer in their 20s is and when women get it 50s, 60s, we all know an aunt, a mother, a friend. I mean, all of us know people who've had breast cancer. It's so common. And in older women, it's actually very, very common and can be life-threatening, but not nearly as life-threatening as it is in a woman under 40 and especially in their 20s. So I was facing literally a death sentence because it's so common for young women to die of this disease. It's so much more aggressive. So I put all my knowledge to work and I went ahead and did conventional three drug chemotherapy. I did radiation. I had surgeries, but I also did just like I was doing in my learning, my education. And I added herbs and nutritional supplements. I added prayer, I added meditation. I added friends and family support, like so many different things that were not just the conventional and I survived and I got through that. And it really kind of shifted me mid-career to really going from doctor to patient and to actually understanding. And I met some doctors during that journey that were horrendously inept. And I met some that were the most amazing people that I felt like saved my life. So not only did I experience the medical education there, but I experienced the uh, what a patient goes through, the fear and the unknown and the trying to figure out a pathway. One of the biggest lessons of that time was there's so much data out there and there's no, we think there's like one black and white path of what do you do when you're 25 year old with aggressive ductal carcinoma, but there's no right or wrong or black and white answer. And here I was with a medical education, searching through the tomes of information to try to make decisions. And I realized it's all gray. And even if one doctor says this, another doctor says this, I ultimately had to make a decision. And what I took out of that and what I still teach my patients today is, when you're faced with this massive life-threatening decision, whether it's health or finances or your family or whatever, you take all the information that you can get at that point, and then you make the best decision you can with that information, but you never second guess. You never go back and say, well, what if? Because if, if you do, you live in a cycle of regret. And I didn't want that to be me. And so I was able to make a decision and stick with it, even though it affected my health for the next 20 years. Right, right. Definitely some big decisions for sure. And I, you know, just hearing that, I, I would think that, you know, that experience had to have like obviously developed like so much more empathy or compassion, you know, for the patients that you ended up, you know, seeing going forward in the future as a doctor, you know, I would think like for, for a doctor who's maybe just been healthy their whole life and, you know, they want to help other people and they see other people who are sick and do their best to help them. I mean, you know, nothing against that. Obviously, that's great. But to actually have gone through it yourself, to have made it out on the other side, it's like, as you were saying, you kind of like know what, you know, a serious illness is like and to help kind of guide a patient through that. It seems like just that firsthand experience, I mean, obviously was was a horrible thing you had to deal with, but seems like it it ended up, I'm assuming probably been a, a pretty beneficial thing in, you know, your career as a doctor. Toby, you are so right on the nail. You hit the nail on the head because um, I didn't know it at the time, but that was my first lesson in experiential transformation. And what I didn't know the moment I was diagnosed was for number one, how's this going to end? Number two, is this going to completely disrupt my life? I had to take nine months off of medical school. And I thought my career was ended. It didn't end my career though. It, it supercharged my career, as you mentioned, and all these things and decisions and that, but what I learned in that, and then my life continued to have difficulties in medicine and relationships in many different ways is, but here's the pearl for everyone listening in the midst of our most difficult circumstances and the most painful and the most hard, there are some pearls and some things there that we cannot get anywhere else. And if we're willing to open our heart and mind to those lessons and those learnings, they can transform us and take us to another level. I would have never thought that that experience would be helpful to my career as a doctor but there's no better experience because then all of a sudden when I started telling my story, I became connected to my patients because they're like, 
you understand you've been through these difficult things. And when I'd sit with a patient and listen in medical school, we're taught to be objective, to remain kind of, you know, mask and not share emotion, never cry in front of a patient, God forbid, you know, and I learned that in medical school, but I had the heart of an empath, like that was impossible. And going through this, what I realized the top doctors that touched me the most were those that actually emotionally connected to me. So I would be sitting in front of a patient and see them and hear their stories. And I'd be like, Oh, I'm so sorry. That must be so hard. And once in a while, I even tell little bits of my own story, only just to connect, not to that it's about me, but because I want them to know I do understand I've been there. And that transformed my practice of medicine and also my practice because patients want someone who they can connect with and who actually gets it. Not that I understand everyone's disease, but I do understand suffering and I do understand hard decisions and I do understand loss. And like you said at the beginning, in the midst of this, there are these incredible bits of wisdom and growth if we're willing to look for them. Well put. And, and you know, it's it was also the other thing I wanted to touch on, uh, something that you said earlier, just about, you know, your, your medical school, like rotation of like, you know, being able to work with like a, a Chinese medicine practitioner and you being the only one doing that. Can you speak on a little bit just like the climate of like functional medicine or holistic medicine, like back kind of when you were going through medical school and like witnessing the progression to where it's gotten today, where I feel like people must be like way more accepting, open, and and honestly like believing in that, you know, the spirit, mind, body, all these things are like connected and important versus how people probably mostly thought a few decades ago. Yeah. And, you know, I graduated almost 20 years ago, 2003 from medical school. So it really, I mean, it goes by fast, right? It was, but it still wasn't that long. It wasn't like in the sixties or fifties or whatever, like it this was in the, you know, two thousands. And uh, what you're saying is so true. And I think many patients that right now may be frustrated with their healthcare, frustrated with their doctor, whatever, most med medical doctors, male and female, whoever go into medicine because they truly want to help and serve people. But the system, I call it a chapter in a book called the empathy destroyer. And it's about medical school because at least when I was training, it's a little better, but it's still kind of a paternalistic, very masculine energy. And we all have both masculine and feminine energy, but masculine is driven, agenda, striving, uh, achievement oriented, and, and not about emotion and not about connection and not about intuition. And we're all taught to use that left side of our brain, which I'm really happy to be really good at. I'm a bioengineer background. I love the analytical thinking, but the real power that's happened in my transition through medicine in these 20 years is going down to my heart and my intuition, and my feeling, and actually using sometimes that to guide medical decision-making and then proving it with science. Like there's the right and the left, there's a masculine and feminine, but in medical school, it's very predominantly left brain, masculine driven and very non-empathetic because there's this uh, theme of objectivity. So in order to remain, to make a good decision, you must remain objective. And if you are to remain objective, you cannot engage. It's like the, the soldier who cannot engage in the conflict. You cannot engage in the battle. You have to remain objective and mask. So we are taught that, and then that goes into the clinic. Someone's sitting there weeping and suffering and saying, my dad just died of a heart attack. I'm afraid. I'm the same age as him. Do I have a risk? And we're sitting there like, nope, your risk is 3% and you're going to be fine. And then we walk away because we have two minutes for the visit, right? Like that is ridiculous because that person's heart, their intuitive heart and their physical heart needs some human comfort and connection and not just a stat. The stats are great, but then you need this connection. So it really taught me a whole different level. And sadly, that training is so brutal. It's a caste system. It's very paternalistic. And the kind of hours I was right before the work hour regulations, now it's a little bit more regulated, but even so it's not like it should be. How it was, was I would do 36 hour shifts now we had a call room. So if there was nothing going on, we could take a quick cat nap, but that could be 36 hours up. And can you imagine the brain on no sleep? I mean, you do this for literally the podcast, right? Like you talk about neurohacking and the importance of sleep and memory and cognition and all of this. It's literally setting. And what it's supposed to do is how do you deal with um, great medical decisions and making good decisions under stress? But what it does is it completely demoralizes the humanity of the resident and so all of a sudden, if you're woken up at 2 a.m. to someone sick in the ER, you're like, oh, here we go again. And it's another number. It's another thing because they lose their humanity. That person sitting in front of you because you're tired and you're exhausted and you're so overworked. You don't have food. You may don't, maybe don't even have enough water, like, like the basic necessities. And sometimes you'd be like um, scrubbed in for a surgery in the middle of the night for emergency. You'd be retracting tissues for the main surgeon. You'd be standing there for six or eight hours, no bathroom, no water, no, I mean, the the ability for them to create a culture 
that denies the basic human needs is unbelievable. And so it's really, at least when I was trained, and I was trained in a phenomenal medical school in Chicago, and it still was brutal. Yeah, that that just honestly, it makes no sense. I mean, I mean, I, I, it's almost sounds kind of like a, you know, your experience and other people's experiences. It's like almost sounds like you know, like a boot camp where it's just like right. trying to put you under as much load as possible and see if you can make it through. But it's like what we know about the brain, everything that you were saying, and like just decision fatigue. Like we know people are not going to make as good decisions when they're a little bit sleep deprived, like let alone they're making, you know, like focusing all day, all night and, you know, for 36 hours. It's like, that doesn't make much sense to me. That's, that's crazy. And can you imagine <laughs> not only that, but the shaming, because say you go 36 hours, you're exhausted. You have one more patient you're trying to get through and get home. And like your emotions are unstable because you've had no sleep or whatever. And you might shed it, like say you would shed a tear. Again, there's shaming around human emotion, human connection. The things that actually would create a culture of compassion are shamed. Right, right. Yeah, that that certainly is not, not ideal in any sense. Uh, Dr. Jill, I wanted to switch gears a little bit and talk about something that I know uh, you have a lot of expertise in, which is toxic mold illness. And this is something that I is a particular interest of mine um, because I actually had to go through my own kind of healing journey dealing with that. Like my, I'm not sure if I shared this on the podcast before. I've had a couple of mold experts on, but I'm not sure if I mentioned. Um, I basically uh, my freshman year of college, like I came into university like feeling you know very healthy. You know, I was normal teenager, and then I moved into a dorm. I didn't know it at the time, but it had toxic mold. I ended up having like, I was, my hair was starting to fall out. I was having like half a dozen nosebleeds a day, couldn't concentrate in any of my classes, like everything, like my life was like falling apart and I didn't know what was going on. I saw like all these different doctors, my freshman year, all these different tests, no answers. And then like literally within like three days of moving out of the dorm back into my mom's house, I felt like probably like 75% of the symptoms just went away. And I was at that point, like, oh my God, it was something in the environment. And that's when I stumbled across mold and got really interested in like Dr. Shoemaker's work and learning all of the complex kind of biochemistry of what these mold toxins are doing to our bodies. And specifically, like for me, I was so interested in like my brain because it was like, I, I truly was like, I felt like a different person. Like I, the mental clarity and creativity and, and everything I felt like was just squashed to the point that I was just this, this, like just barely functioning person. And so I, I, you know, just having gone through all of that and learning all these different things to recover from that. I mean, it's always been a huge sort of passion of mine and something I feel like that a lot of people don't know about, or maybe they don't have to deal with it because they're in that 75% that I I'm aware of that don't have that uh, that HLA-DR genetic variant, right? Where their their body's kind of more able to clear mycotoxins. I'm I'm in the 25% that is not. Um, but you know, just tell me kind of about if you could sort of just break down mold illness for the listeners who some of which you know longtime listeners may have heard a couple pa- uh, past guests talk about it. But for those of um, whom uh, aren't too familiar, can you just break it down a little bit and how mold affects the mind and body? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and once again, I had an experience 2013 Boulder flooded massive, they called it a thousand year flood and underwater and massive, massive, literally billions of dollars of damage. My office was in South Boulder and it had been an older office anyway, and probably had previous water damage, but the flood really took it to a new level. And there was bulk stachybotrys, which is one of the really toxic black molds growing in my basement. And then my office was on the second level, right above an unfinished crawl space that had standing water. I didn't know any of this at the time, but what I knew the year following, I started going downhill just like you. And I'm pretty bright, usually pretty analytical, astute. And I was having trouble with focusing, concentrating, just like you said, names. Um, I could still put together a medical plan, but like names and, and words and word finding and fatigue and skin rashes and um, uh, redness of my eyes. And then sometimes shortness of breath or congestion. And I did, hadn't had any of those things before. So I was going downhill and I had to figure out what it was. And just like you, I ran into mold. And in medical school, back to this again, we're taught that mold is an allergen, which is true. Um, and an allergen is the adaptive, I'm sorry, the innate 
adaptive immune system. The adaptive immune system is basically how we respond to say horses or cows or nuts or cheese, things that we're allergic to. And many people have a mold allergy. In fact, if you're penicillin allergic, which is an antibiotic, that's mold. So you're probably also mold allergic. That's a common thing to notice. If you are penicillin allergic, you're probably mold allergic too. So that's an adaptive immune system. That's um, an, an acquired thing that's there for many people. But what you and I are talking about is a whole different arm of the immune system called the innate immune system. Now, this was made famous with COVID and the pandemic because all of a sudden on the news, we started hearing about cytokines and about inflammation. And a lot of the people, especially early on with the more severe strains, the reason they actually passed away was because of their own immune system, their own innate immune system getting triggered, going haywire. And that whole inflammatory concept inside the body was literally the thing that took them, like took their lungs out or took their heart, you know, stopped or whatever, because that cytokine storm can be so intense that it can cause massive collateral damage. Mold is no, known to be a very significant trigger. So literally the day after Christmas, 2014, I found there was mold in my basement and I had mold in my urine. So one of the ways we test people who are curious about maybe having mold is we do urinary mycotoxin tests. There's about three companies out there, real-time lab, um, vibrant lab, Great Plains lab. They're all good. Um, and you can actually get from your doctor a test testing your urine to see if you're excreting the toxins that mold creates. So again, I found this out the hard way because I was going downhill. And then when I learned it was mold, I have since become an expert because I had to figure out how in the world did I get, do I, did I get this? And did I get well from this? Now you mentioned for listeners, something really important. And I asked this, we kind of do a timeline, like, when did you last feel well? So if you're listening, you're like, I don't feel so well nowadays. When did I last feel well? You can go back a year or six months or five years. And then you can do a timeline and say, when did things start to change? And you notice in hindsight, you in the dorm and then out of the dorm, you're like, oh, you clearly saw the timeline, right? Of this episode that was environmentally focused. So if anyone listening is and knows that like ever since they moved to a new home or ever since they moved to a new area or some environmentally, or I've had patients where they go camping or hiking, or they go away to Hawaii for two weeks and they feel great. Those are clues that there's something in your environment that's toxic to you, just like your story. And that's a real important thing for me to share, because if you're listening, you're not sure um, that's a big clue. Mold is the biggest masquerader. It can cause Alzheimer's dementia. Dr. Bredesen, who I work with, does the recode and Bredesen protocol for reversing Alzheimer's. And he has been quoted as saying early onset dementia, one in three, one in three cases is mold related. And I think it's actually higher. And so does he, but that was his statistic. That's huge. So someone, he talked about 55 year old attorney who stopped practicing because they couldn't concentrate or think mold-related illness, and they were diagnosed with early-onset Alzheimer's. So that's real common. The other thing it can masquerade as is new-onset autoimmunity, new-onset undiagnosed inflammatory conditions, chronic fatigue, migraine headaches. Um, it can cause gut issues, so it causes massive damage in the gut, massive permeability. So if someone all of a sudden has uh, new food sensitivities or new onset of heartburn, which can be a histamine manifestation, um, especially worse in a certain environment, those are all clues. Skin can be affected. So rashes and uh, lesions and acne. I had cystic acne for several years after, right? Breakouts, you're Me not too. even <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so C4A, which is a marker, one of those uh, split products, mm -hmm. cytokine complements, which is almost always high after mold exposure, will cause cystic acne. I had horrendous acne when I had mold exposure, super common. And then the lungs are affected. So you might have new onset shortness of breath, be diagnosed with new onset asthma, be diagnosed with some random interstitial lung thing that no one knows what it is. And often it's a little mysterious because they can label it with other things like you have new onset Hashimoto's or new onset lupus or new onset fatigue or new onset on the cognitive decline, but the root for many of these things is mold. Just like you quoted a couple of statistics, there's one in four people who have trouble tagging and clearing these toxins when we get exposed and they can come in through the respiratory tract. We can ingest them, but that's actually not usually as dangerous um, as in inhalation because what we know now is the mold Mold spores themselves are pretty large. They don't like go into the bloodstream. Um, they can trigger inflammation, but usually what we're breathing in in a moldy environment, a home, a workplace, a car, is the toxins that mold produces. These are volatile organic compounds, 2.5 microns and less, which means they can transfuse into our blood, I'm sorry, into the, we breathe them in, into the alveoli, directly into the bloodstream without transport. They're that small. So the same thing as like smoke from fire or formaldehyde or smoke from cigarettes. Those are all in the class of these very small VOCs that can go directly into our lungs and cause inflammation. So literally within seconds of breathing, air in a moldy environment, our alveoli transport that toxin into the blood. And immediately we have mycotoxins in the blood. 
And the deal is these mycotoxins, trichosithenes, aflatoxin, um, ochratoxin, they are all known to be incredibly toxic, toxic to kidneys, toxic to the brain. You and I both experienced that toxic to our nervous system, toxic to the gut. And you can name almost any tissue and by immune system. You can find data on how toxic it is to different systems. Trichosithene is one of the worst types of mycotoxins from black mold, like stachybotrys and ketomium, is literally being studied as a chemical warfare agent. It's so toxic. So as you and I noticed, it can be, so if you're listening like, well, how do I know? You can be in a room like my study here and it looks beautiful and there's no sign of water damage. I would say 90% of my patients have a bathroom or a room or a basement or crawl space where it looks pretty good on the outside. But if you think about, have you ever had a fridge line leak? Have you ever had a washer or dryer leak? Have you ever had a under the sink leak? Has a bathtub ever been leaked? And nowadays actually new construction is sometimes more dangerous than old because the way they put things together so quickly and a lot of times they're putting tile down with no vapor barrier or no water barrier so that that grout is permeable. As soon as you get a shower hitting that or water on that tile, the um, grout can be permeable. You can have water back behind there into your drywall that's going to be a nidus for mold within six months to a year. And these are just some small examples, but it's super common. And a lot of people just feel like they're getting unwell or they're not as strong as they used to be, or their cognition's going, we're aging, which is a horrible excuse, right? And the truth is mold is behind many, many, many situations of illness that people don't even know. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it, you know, at thinking about it, like looking back, it feels so obvious of like, oh yeah, you know, I moved, moved into the dorm. I started experiencing symptoms, but like, you know, at the time I was starting college, it was like all this, you know, different and, you know, stress and like all these other things that I kind of like, I blamed it on that other people blamed it on. And I've talked to so many people who it's like that same way. It's like, it only kind of makes sense in hindsight, you know, a lot of times when you look back and it's like, you can connect the dots, but it can, it can okay, really... let's talk about that because I have some neuroscience behind those two things. Yeah, yeah. So important. And when I wrote my book, I really dove into that because I was like, number one, mold masquerades and, and steals your insight. What you and I are describing is like when you're in it, you can even, even for me, I've had mold. I know mold really well. I could still even walk into a building and get a mold exposure and I'd be confused. I'd be just like, oh, I don't feel well. Or I might be sad for no reason at all. Or I might be like, I'm, I'm a little foggy. And literally after years and years and like doing this for 10,000 hours plus, I know this well, I can still that insight into understanding in real time what's happening, somehow mold sabotages that. And that is in the literature. And then there's another thing in the literature that I think is fascinating. There's a traumatic effect with mold. And I knew this, I saw this, I saw limbic activation, like amygdala, like fight or flight, fear responses for people who had been in chronic mold, gotten out, then many of them become fearful of getting exposed again. And, you know, they're, they're like living in this fear space. Some of them go out to the desert and live in camp for a while. They have this mold avoidance groups, nothing wrong with that. Some people get well that way. So please, if you're listening and you've had that experience, there is no judgment here at all, because some people do really well. But the thing behind that is, as you all know, as a neuro you know, hacker, um, it's the limbic response. And we literally, the studies I looked at, you can have a chemical inhalation through the nose, cribriform plate goes directly to the HPA axis and triggers the limbic amygdala response, just the chemical smell of mold. So even if we're like, we've done our emotional work, we've done NLP, we've done all the work around like being emotionally safe and we're limbically sound and we're not in a fight or flight response, we can be that person. And still, if we come, if we have that past exposure and that neuro triggering, we can come into a moldy environment, smell that mold or chemical, and even subconsciously all of a sudden go into a fight or flight response because the chemical is triggering a limbic response, even if our mind knows it's safe. Isn't that crazy? That is fascinating. Wow. I did not know that. I'm curious to hear, you know, some of the other uh, besides mold, like what, what other sort of things are uh, sort of sabotaging a lot of people's health, like with your experience, you know, working in functional medicine and holistic medicine, uh, you know, that maybe a lot of people don't know about. And, you know, maybe specifically, if we could kind of tie this to like brain health or mental health, what sort of things do you, uh, you know, are often kind of the underlying drivers behind a lot of people's anxiety, depression, fatigue, all that sort of stuff. I'm going to say something that might be kind of controversial, but I no longer believe in organic depression, anxiety, bipolars. I no longer believe there's just organic. Someone's just born that way. What the hard part about hearing that is, is we've uh, off put any onus on ourselves. And so what I'm not saying it's your fault. So please hear me here. I'm not trying to blame the victim. 
because I know sometimes when you're in that deep dark hole of depression or even feeling suicidal it is the hardest place in the world and you need help and you need people to love and surround and understand so I'm walking this fine line but as I know about environmental toxic load and infections and inflammation every person I've ever seen with early onset dementia, cognitive decline, depression, anxiety, insomnia, fatigue, migraines, uh, bipolar. I found a root cause that is not organic. It just means they're not born that way. Um, and I'll explain here in a nutshell, functional medicine, when I look at a patient and see a patient for the first time, it's always in my mind, toxic load, what's in their bucket. I think of it as like the analogy of a bucket or we're all born with the capacity for detox, our liver and our gallbladder and our kidneys and our skin we're made as detox machines, like we can do this. But what happens is as we fill up that bucket over a lifetime of exposures, it starts to spill over the top. And when that water level becomes too high and spills over the top, we present with cancer, autoimmunity and neurodegeneration, so brain dysfunction. And there's more, but those are the top three. And I see this over and over and over again. So what I see is a patient coming in and their toxic load is so high, they can no longer have the margin in the bucket so that they can detox. And my job is to say, what's in your bucket? How do we lower that load through detox, through protocols, through functional medicine, so that you can have that margin back because any, I believe any human being, um, and I'm a proof of this, I was so toxic with mold and other things and cancer and all these things that I learned how to give that margin back. So toxic loads on one side and infectious burden is on the other. What many people don't know is that um, chicken pox from five years old or that mono from a 19 year old in college or that um, other virus they didn't even know they had or long COVID. These viruses, if they are in a weakened immune system can come back and create massive dysfunction that looks like autoimmunity, that looks like study recently came out millions of participants. So the power of the study was so strong in the military and it was the connection between um, MS and Epstein-Barr. And I wrote about that in my blog because it's so profound that a virus could contribute to this. Now I'm not saying every case of MS has Epstein-Barr involved, but there was a massively weighted study of millions of people that showed there was a connection in many cases. And so this toxic load infectious burden as a functional detective is always on my mind when someone walks in the door with symptoms and I'm going, which piece is which, which do we treat, treat first? But always those two buckets are part of the creation of inflammation and dysfunction. And if I can unload that bucket and deal with the infections that are popping up and not under control, for example, Epstein-Barr, we get mono when we're a kid. We get Lyme, we get a tick bite when we're a kid. And we're fine for 20, 30, 40 years. Why is that? That's because when our immune system is robust, keeping these things in check, we can walk around and have old infections and we all do and we're fine. So the difficulty is we get such a toxic load weakens our immune system and then all of a sudden we get sick or we manifest joint pain and fatigue as new onset Lyme disease when actually we were bit by a tick 30 years ago. So this is how I see it and how I view the patients as they're coming in. And I'm always looking. And the great thing about the toxic load is there's probably tens of thousands of chemicals in each of our bodies. We know from cord blood studies of babies born 20 years ago, the cord blood already had 200 chemicals at birth. And that was 20 years ago, 2001. So can you imagine like we're coming into this life with a half full bucket and then it just continues to fill up. But that concept, when you think about it, and when you start to dive in to lower that load, even if you don't know all the toxins, all of a sudden resilience comes back and hope comes back and we can turn around. And for me, I've been through cancer and Crohn's no longer have either been through mold related illness. I can think and process and do things just like I used to be able to. So hope is very real because we can overcome these things that seem impossible. Yeah. And, and with like the work I do, just, I always emphasize like neuroplasticity. We know your yeah. brain is capable of changing. You're not stuck with the brain that you have today. And whether it's like mold, Lyme, or any of these other things that are like increasing your toxic load and preventing you from being able to think clearly or have a good mood or, you know, manage your stress. Like all of this can be dealt with if you're able to like, you know, give the brain the right the brain and body, the right stimulus. Yeah. And I'm curious, like what for you, like, what are your most, uh, what are your favorite ways of like promoting uh, detox or enhancing the immune system and helping people really kind of decrease that toxic load that you mentioned? Uh, love this. So I, January is coming around the corner and a lot of people are like, oh, I'm going to do a 21 day detox or a 30 day this or that, or a cleanse. Um, I've been to Switzerland myself to do liver gallbladder detoxes for two weeks. So I'm a fan of those things, but I say that because one time week thing, January doesn't do it anymore. And so what I do is every single day, every day, 
I incorporate daily detox habits. I'll tell you a few of mine and everybody's different. Um, one thing I've used is biohacking. I use things like the aura ring to actually look and say, does this intervention change my physiology? So I'm actually using science to say, for example, right here on the floor, I have a PMF mat, that white, you know, covered thing there. I'm a huge fan of that mat. Last week, I had a little bit of a laryngitis and I laid on that every day. Day, it felt so good. It totally changed my temperature, my physiology. So PMF is a huge one. I use it almost every single day. Um, Epsom salt baths. I'm a huge fan of Epsom salt baths. They're simple. Most anyone can tolerate them. And if you're energetic empath like me, not only does it physically cleanse and add the magnesium sulfate for detox into your body through your skin, but energetically, the salt is a good cleansing agent before bed. And for me, it's like that routine. I am a such a big fan of good sleep. Like that is my secret to living well and thriving is I get great sleep. And I put that as such a priority years ago there, my friend might be like, let's go to a hockey game. And it was going to be like till midnight. I'm like, I can't go. Cause I'm not going to sleep. Bro. Like I would make choices based on keeping that sleep sacred. So sleep is sacred. Whatever routines you create before bed are sacred. The Epsom salt baths, infrared sun. I have that in my office. And at least once or twice a week, I'll sit there for 30 minutes and sweat out those toxins, PCBs, phthalates, parabens, mold toxins. A lot of those really come out best through our skin. So you want to sit in there 130, 135 degrees infrared for 30 minutes and then wipe off or wash off or, or, or shower afterwards. So you get those things off your skin and you can do electrolyte stirring. Other daily detox things. I take charcoal almost every single day. That's a binder for mold toxins. I still do that. I take it when I travel. Um, so mold or, or a clay, well call and cold I mean, our, our prescription binders, those are a little more harsh. I don't think they're as good for daily long-term use. Um, and then I take nutrients like N-acetylcysteine, like poic acid, glutathione. When I was a little sick last week, I nebulized N-acetylcysteine and glutathione. It turned my lungs around. So those are just some simple things. If you want detox nutrients that support phase one, phase two, glutathione, NAC, like poic acid, milk thistle. You want binders if you've been exposed to mold, clay, charcoal, chlorella, glycomannans. You want to do daily things like infrared sauna, Epsom salt baths. You want to do connection with friends, walking in nature, maybe having a pet. All of those things create resilience and help you detox day to day. Yeah. I, I totally agree. And I, I mean, I found like a lot of those same things super helpful for me. I mean, actually like to the left of me right now, I'm looking at a little portable uh, infrared sauna that's in my office that I use, like try to use most mornings. I love it. And for me, I mean, those, a lot of those things that you mentioned, uh, the glutathione, the uh, clay, um, charcoal, all of those things, like when I was dealing with mold and I first like became aware of those things. I mean, I mentioned, you know, how just getting out of the environment itself maybe got me like 75% of the way back to feeling good. I mean, I was also, you know, a very young, you know, I was 18, 19 at the time. So it's like, I had a leg up on someone who's yes. <laughs> 60, 70 years old dealing with like mold illness. Right. So I, my body kind of shot back to relatively normal pretty quickly, but, but to get myself the other like 25% back of the way, I felt like all of those, a lot of those things that you mentioned were like so critical and so uh, hugely beneficial. Um, So we're, we're coming up on to the end of the show here, but I'm, I'm curious for, um, for the listeners, you know, who are, who are interested in functional medicine or interested in optimizing uh, their health, what other sort of ways, um, besides just promoting detox or simulating the immune system, what other uh, things would you really recommend that, you know, people could maybe institute uh, or integrate into like their kind of daily practice just to increase their overall health and vitality? Yeah. So we didn't go into this at all. I go into it a couple of chapters in the book, but one thing I learned that was maybe the most profound out of all these other things in the physical realm was, I feel like that we talked about left brain and the analytical mind and how do we approach problems that way. But for me, many of my years, I lived from my neck up. I was all analytical. I, I didn't feel a lot of deep emotion, especially sadness and anger. And so I kind of suppressed that and I was very productive. I was highly high performance, you know, but what I had to do in the last five years or so was really go down into my heart and my intuition and heal those parts of myself. So that trauma work, that NLP I've done, and that really at the core, it's trusting our intuition and then loving ourselves in a healthy way. Because when we love ourselves, autoimmunity is less likely. And some of these things, this inflammatory processes are less likely. And that sounds really easy, but it really is this, I, I often write a prescription, be kind to yourself 
because we can be pretty if we listen to the tape recording in our head oh my gosh you're an idiot oh this or that we so often are very cruel to ourselves and we're more cruel to ourselves than we'd ever be to a good friend or someone we love and so we listen to that and we replay it and we can be like oh sweetheart you're doing a good job or oh my goodness you know great work I have another little sticky note in my medicine cabinet that says what does she need from me today and that's just a reminder for me to check into my heart and say does she need rest? Does she need a walk? What does she need from me today? What does little Jill need from big Jill today? And those sound really maybe silly or simple, but those are profound healers is taking care of ourselves, loving ourselves, trusting our intuition. So if you're listening and you've had a medical issue and you've been told by the doctors, you're crazy, there's nothing wrong with you. That's a perfect example of knowing that heart is there is something wrong and finding a practitioner, or someone to actually help you and listen to you and validate you because so often there's this gaslighting that goes on in medicine and it doesn't do us any good to find real answers. Well said. Yeah, I, I couldn't put it better myself. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Well, Dr. Jill, I've I've really appreciated you know this and really enjoyed this conversation we've had today. If listeners want to find out more about your work, connect with you, find your books, um, where would you direct them to? Thank you so much. It's been so fun to be here. Um, book is coming out March seventh, and it looks like this. It's available now for pre order, and for your listeners, I have a special gift. Um, we've released the first chapter for free. So anyone at all who's like, oh, I don't know if I want to buy this book or I don't know if I'm interested or whatever, you can literally go to read unexpected slash free chapter and download the first free chapter just to see if it fits, if it's something that resonates with you. Um, I hope you'll still buy the book, but either way, it's free for you. Um, and readunexpected.com has all the information. My regular website that's been around forever is just my name, jillcarnian.com. And there's also loads, like 10 or 12 years of free blogs, resources on mold, free mold guides. And I do my own podcast too. So all kinds of free episodes. What I've done for a decade is just try to get information out to those people who maybe can't see me and still need information on mold and autoimmunity and mass cell activation. It's all there on my website for free. Awesome. Well, I'll make sure uh, to leave all of those links and resources for the audience in the show notes. You guys can go ahead. I'd recommend checking that out and reading the first chapter of Dr. Jill's new book, which I have been lucky enough. Thank you so much for sending me a copy early. I've, I've really enjoyed what I've read so far of it. And um, yeah, um, you know, thank you again so much for coming on the show today. You're welcome. It was fun.